Coming up, I'm going to tell you what I've learned after speaking to over 5,000 people on this show. And then, are remote workers productive or pretending? Pay cuts coming? And we're going to coach you up. Let's go. All right, folks, welcome to the Ken Coleman Show, where I coach you up to make more money and experience more meaning, more income, more impact is the goal. So, uh, you know, we've been talking recently as a team, you know, we've got quite a case study when you think about the amount of people that most studies that we even quote and source on this show are usually anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 respondents. In the polling world, uh, that is a healthy sample size. Uh, anything over a thousand is a healthy sample size, and 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 st- statisticians say you can go to the bank uh, on the credibility of that sample size to be able to uh, project uh, widely held views, beliefs, actions. So, on my time here, or in my time here on the show, I've talked to over five thousand callers, uh, and that continues to grow, and. Uh, so I, I want to share with you what I've learned, and it's boy, this isn't everything, right? I mean, we could be, this could be a twenty-four hour show if I t- told you everything that I've learned. It's fascinating. There's some key patterns, and I want to focus in uh, on three things. Number one, what do the five thousand plus callers most have in common? And if I were going to single out one commonality, it is that they are experiencing a gap between where they are. And where they want to be. That's the commonality. Because the, the circumstances can be very, very different. The stages of which they're in their life and career are very, very different. But the one commonality that every caller has had is that they are experiencing a gap. They're looking at a gap. Where they are in the present, they can kind of look down and they see a big old gap. And it's deep and it's long and it's it's needing a bridge. How do they bridge the gap? And they're calling me and they're saying, Ken, I'm not where I want to be. Help me maybe figure out where it is I want to go, how I want to get there, when I need to do it, how the best way to go about it. It's all about building the bridge. So that's the one commonality. I'm not where I want to be. Help me build a bridge. The second commonality is is that um, there's one commonality in the struggle that they have. If I look at all the different callers that go, what's the biggest struggle? There's a handful of common struggles that I address on the show. But if there's just one clear winner and it's way out in front, it's this. And it, it, it involves stage five of the seven stages that I teach. Stage one is get clear. Stage two is get qualified. Stage three is get connected. Stage four is get started. Stage five is get promoted. Stage six, get the dream job. Stage seven, give yourself away. You're working no longer for money. It's there, uh, but this is all about, you don't have to work, but you're doing it because you love it. It's it's about legacy. And as I've thought back through this, and I, and I really did in preparation for this, I, I, I think when I started out, I thought, well, maybe it's the greatest struggle that people have in their career is getting clear. And certainly the numbers would reflect that a lot of people aren't clear. But I find that when I talk to people, coach people, they're way more clear than they present. And so then I looked at it and I said, you know what the number one struggle is? It's getting ahead. It's getting promoted. That's like people get it. People, I hear people all the time. Well, I backed into this career, right? I fell into it. So it's it's almost by happenstance that people get in. So I don't think the greatest struggle is getting in. And I think there is some clarity that people present with. All they need is me to uncover it. I think the biggest issue is I want to get ahead, and it's a competition out there, and that's why I've recently in shows and, and told the team behind the scenes, at the end of the day, what I want to be for the listener and the viewer of the Ken Coleman Show is the coach that helps them compete and win because they are competing. They are competing against themselves, the, the you of yesterday. They are competing against a whole lot of people out there that are trying to climb the ladder as well. And a lot of people shy away from that notion. And I get it. That doesn't mean you got to be a big jerk and 
and become all consumed and obsessed like you know some of these star athletes and and you know you kind of repel against that uh, that notion um and you don't have to be that but you also can't just sit there i think there's a great will rogers quote one of the great entertainers of yesteryear in america and i i believe the quote says even if you're on the right road or right path if you stand in the middle you're still going to get run over and that's what i'm trying to get at and so this is the 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 most difficult part of the path to purpose is understanding that you are in a competition and even if you're on the right path if you just stand there in the middle of it there are a lot of people that are going to run you slam over so that is a big one now if i could change one thing about how people view work today what would I change? And I love this vantage point. After talking to 5,000 people, the greatest perspective that needs to be changed. I mean, the perspective that is overwhelmingly the leader in the clubhouse is this idea that I'm not sure. Some are very sure. So it's either I'm absolutely sure of this, but I'll give Ken a shot. Or I'm not sure that I can do work I love and be loved at the same time. Increasingly, the back half of that sentence is something that is becoming so obvious to me, I cannot ignore it. I cannot ignore it. That on one hand, people will say, you know what, I I, I believe there's work I love, but I don't know if it's worth it. I don't know if it's worth all the struggle, all of the sacrifice to get to do it. And if I do it in a place that sucks and they treat me like crap, why did I do all this in the first place? I really believe that's what's going on for the second half of that sentence. I, I, I believe a lot of people would, 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 would shake their head if I could have a conversation with the entire world and I'd go, how many of you out there believe you could find work that you really enjoy doing? I think a lot of people go, okay, I'll give you that. I think yeah, there's probably work. Or or if I said it this way, how many of you believe there is a type of work that you really enjoy? And a lot of people would say, yeah, okay, I, I, can, I can wrap my head around that. But doing it and actually being valued and cared for and developed and led and mentored and coached, a lot of people don't believe that. So the one perspective that I wish I could give to everybody as a gift and just stick it in your head, like pull the old hard drive out and stick this thought in there is that this is, this is the thought. And I'm going to add a little to it. Something I've said many times on the show, you were created to contribute. And outside of your relationships, the other place to do it is professional. You were created to fill a unique role in your work. You were created to fill a unique role in this world, this big giant world. And I know you're just one person, but trust me, you were created to fill a unique role. That means you are needed. There's tremendous value in who you are and what you have to offer to somebody out there. That means somebody needs you. That means you must do it. You were created to fill a unique role. You were needed and you must do it. And here is the last part. You can find and do work you love and be loved. Coming up. Will working at home mean a pay cut? We'll break it down. You were created to fill a unique role through your work, but it can feel overwhelming to figure out what that is. That's why I created the Get Clear Career Assessment. In just 15 minutes, you'll get customized results that clarify what you do best, the work you love to do, and the results that motivate you. All this helps you discover what you were born to do. And you'll get a list of professional possibilities to help you in your job search. To get started, go to kencoleman.com slash assessment. Oh boy! Ho ho ho! The increasing tension and stare down, standoff, you pick the analogy, 
Um, it's getting interesting, Alex. Headline from the LA Times. Working at home may soon include a pay cut. I, I don't know what to think of this. I, I, I'm going to work my, my way through this one because I, I, got, I got thoughts all over the place on this thing. And, and, and I, I get what leaders might be thinking here. And I'm not so sure I disagree with it, but boy, oh boy, do I think it's risky. Let's break it down. Um, here's where we stand. About 30% of all paid workdays are still being done from home. Um, paid workdays are being done from home, up from 5% before COVID. So obviously we saw an explosion of uh, remote work. And uh, now there is a movement that is uh, catching on abroad across the pond, according to British law firm uh, Stevenson Harwood. Uh, they announced that employees could work full-time from home on the condition that they take a 20% pay cut. <whistles> Providing my own sound effects today. Uh, that is that is substantial. You want to talk about a shot across the bow, that's it. Uh, this is not happening, uh, at least widely reported enough, to make this article from the LA Times, assuming they did their research, in the U.S., but I have heard rumblings of it. There's no question about it. We did see that if you chose to move from a metropolitan area for Google, for instance, we reported on this, I believe, last year. Uh, but if you were to move from a metropolitan area to a rural uh, or suburban area where the cost of living was less, Google was saying, we're not going to pay you what you were paid before. Or there's going to be a cost of living reduction because it doesn't cost as much to live in the metropolitan area. So that did, that was a thing that happened and Google announced that. So I've seen that. Not so dramatic as boom, hey, you can work remote, but if you do, we're taking 20% of your paycheck. That's a sizable chunk. The Working From Home Project found that four in 10 employers plan to use remote work as a way to ease overall wage growth pressures. Now, that does not necessarily mean that they would slash salaries of existing employees. For example, what they would do is they would try to fill new openings with remote workers in cheaper markets, okay? So now that is an interesting shift, and I think that makes a lot of sense on the surface. Uh, but a significant 14% of employers said they were planning to cut wages for teleworkers in lower-cost areas, and 17% said they were undecided. Now, here's my takeaway on this. As I said, um, I certainly understand that if we as a leadership structure in an organization go, you know what? We did the remote thing for a while. We want to go to a hybrid thing or we want to go to everybody coming back to the office. If that's what we decide, then we got to we got to we got to do it. And we go this is what it is. And as a result, we're happy for you to uh uh stay remote um because we want everybody in. We will allow for remote options. Um we're not going to pay as much. Because you're not commuting, you're not in the office, you're not in a higher cost area of living. Whatever your reasons are, I understand that. I understand the thinking behind it. But I would also say if somebody decided, I go, hey, it's your call. But I, I got to tell you, as your advisor, that's risky. It's really risky and it's demoralizing. And here's why. Let's take that British law firm. They told people, and there was a certain amount of people that wanted to work from home. And so you look, think about the emotion in, involved in that sentence, the first half. All right, hey, we're going to allow you to work from home. And then you say, but you got to take a 20% pay cut. Ooh. And what you have just done there is, it's like a, um, it's like a, it's like a gag gift. It's like me coming in and handing Joe, hey, Joe, I got you a present today. And it's all wrapped nicely. It's got a nice bow on it. Looks like a normal gift. Joe goes, all right, all right. Yeah, what's the deal? He's excited. Then he opens it up, and it's some gag gift. It's a salt shaker from my kitchen table or what? It's nothing. It's like, what? What? You just jacked with my emotions. That's what this is. Hey, we're going to lie to you work from home, but you got to take a 20% pay cut. That doesn't end well. They're not going to stay with you long term. And again, I'm not saying your decision is right or wrong, folks. I'm I'm commentating right now to say that the risk is you're going to make a leadership decision and you need to plan that when you make a decision like that, they're going to leave you because that's something they probably won't recover from because it feels like a bait and switch. 
and they're the ones that want to work from home anyway. And given the world psychology and where we are and the type of jobs we got, I think a lot of people are willing to leave. We've seen the data that says they are. And I think when push comes to shove, some of them may put at risk their income because you've already told them you're going to take a 20% hit. So I, I, I think you got to be careful with that one. That one's risky. But I understand. Draw the line of sand leaders and be okay if people leave you. That's the point I'm making. All right. Uh, now a story from Inc. Magazine. Remote workers are wasting more than an hour a day on productivity. Theater. So they're faking it. They're acting productive. And you know, when I first read this, I was like, that's pretty good. I, I'm like, okay. I mean, I, it's not a surprise this is happening at all. What am I talking about? So they surveyed 2,000 knowledge workers in the U.S. and the U.K. Um, and uh, a Killing Time at Work report found that online workers are behaving too much like cubicle workers of decades past. Duh. Just because somebody's in a cube doesn't mean they're not wasting a bunch of time. We all do it. I'm not a bunch of time. I tell you, I don't waste a bunch of time. But we've all been known to sit there and five minutes of scrolling. You're like, oh, crap, I could be doing my job. And I'm scrolling, looking at some stupid cat video. Um. I want to read from this report because this is startling. The dramatic workplace shifts of the pandemic gave us a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to reshape how we work. Um, we could have restructured work to be asynchronous, allowing us to build work around our lives, but we failed. Now the research shows we're falling back into old habits, ones that could have been cast aside when we had a chance. So what's this look like? Remote workers joining Zoom meetings they know are worthless, responding to emails at strategically selected hours or other forms of ostentatiously online, of being ostentatiously online to convince colleagues of working long hours. Well, that's brilliant, right? You're a remote worker and you haven't done jack squat for four hours. You hop online to answer five emails at eight o'clock and they go, huh, oh, Nathan's burning the candle at both ends over there. Way to go, Nathan. Hey man, take a break tomorrow. You worked hard today. Send in that. Those are great emails at eight o'clock. Well, he hasn't worked since two. I mean, that's what's happening. And listen, we've reported on this show, people are holding out two full-time jobs because of this kind of stuff right here. So what does that lead to? So this kind of digital presenteeism, they're saying, eats up 67 minutes of the average remote worker's day, wasting time just trying to look productive. Now, you combine this with 81% of people believe they're more productive when they have more flexibility over work, but they're abusing it. So now you've got, um, you got, they got leaders going, all right, I'll let you uh, do remote work, but I'm going to monitor you. Remember the story we shared of the lady who got up from her computer in the kitchen to cook a meal and the computer logged her out? So the so the the snap reaction is all right. You really want to work remote, but we we think you're doing this kind of crap. We don't trust you. There's no credibility or trust built between leader and worker. So now we're going to monitor you like you're a child, and so that's an overreaction from the company. So what does it do? It's like the worst of both worlds colliding: a worker not being responsible and honorable, and good stewards. And then bosses acting like, you know, the secret police of a dictator monitoring every move you make. You know, every step you take, I'll be watching you. You know, it's like, hey, what's going on? I don't want Sting for a boss. You know, well, no, nobody wants that. And so that's the snap reaction. And it's dangerous. And again, I think it's got to be less about, I think the future for leaders to figure this out is it's got to be less about the amount of time you work and where you work. And it's got to be about real measurable results, which will dictate the time and take care of the rest. Did you know that just like a product, you have a personal brand? It's the image or impression others form about you based on your interactions. And whether we realize it or not, our personal brand impacts opportunities to grow in our careers. That's why our team created the Personal Brand Survey. It's free and it will give you personal and professional feedback so you can own your strengths and uncover any blind spots holding you back. To get started, 
Go to KenColeman.com slash brand. Welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show, where we help you win in your work and in your life. They are inextricably connected, and you need to realize that and figure out, okay, what do I need to do to win in work? How's it going to affect me in my personal life? And I, hey, if I got some junk going on in my personal life, I got to get that under control because I'm dragging that to work. And we want you to be on purpose, winning most days, because you are showing up and spending the majority of your day using what you do best to do work you love to produce results that matter to you. Okay, this is a fascinating story, case study, real-life story here. The article's from Fast Company, um, and it's about the four-day work week. Now, on previous shows, I've talked about the fact that this is the four-day work week has been tested multiple places in Europe. I believe there's an ongoing study. I believe they're still in the middle of the study, if my memory serves, uh, in the UK, it's been tested, uh, actually tested, not just study, but tested, I believe in Sweden or Denmark or one of those countries over there. Um, and, and so, you know, now it's getting kicked around. Uh, and I told somebody this morning, by the way, Alex, I was telling a friend, we were talking about it. He said, what do you see? And I said, I think the four day work week is coming at us like a runaway locomotive. I think it's coming to the U S and I think it, it, some there's somebody big's going to adopt it, and then you're going to go through the growing pains of figuring out just like everything that kind of happens, right? Remote work, a lot of growing pains. We figured it out. I don't see any way that it's not coming. So I want to comment on this because it's not a guarantee that it's going to be all smooth sailing. Research from the Henley Business School in the UK found that a four-day work week could provide benefits to employers and employees improve work quality, less stress, and a heightened ability to attract and retain talent. Now, it's very important that we focus on words. Words still matter, even in this stupid world we live in right now where everybody's woke and got a different definition of the same word. My truth. If I hear somebody say that one more time, I'm going to spit nails. So let's look at the truth. The study said it could provide those things. Does it? Well, Rebecca Brooks is the founder and CEO of a Los Angeles-based marketing research firm, Alter Agents. When COVID hit, she and her team of 23 employees shifted to remote work, later opting to stay fully remote. And it was just an adjustment. She said there were a lot of stressors. Employers had personal things going on, and there was a lot of chaos. We were trying to help figure out what's the best environment for us. Then Brooks came across some studies and some articles uh, like the ones we probably resourced, uh, about four-day work weeks. And uh, her business, they're in the agency business, so her team has to be available based on a client's deadline. So it's a little different rhythm. So shutting down the office on a Friday wouldn't work. So she thought, well, I can't do a Monday through Thursday because there's just no way we can't be working on a Friday. So the company then decided to test the four-day work week for 10 weeks, and what they did was they allowed the employees to pick the day they could take off, and this required communication. Um, so they went to a four-day, 32-hour week, and they had one basic rule. Two people on the same team couldn't be off the same day. So they were there was somebody in every day of the week, but the employees that communicated together, hey, I'm going to take Tuesday. Okay, great. I'll take Monday, whatever. Okay. And so they went off and running. And the employees were excited about the new schedule, uh, but the results were mixed. So they were initially excited, but then when they got into it, here's what came down the pike. And I think this is fascinating, Alex. She says, and I quote, it really came down to personality type. Some of our employees were allowing their days off to start to become corrupted. In other words, they couldn't keep themselves from doing some work and did a little more work. She said others were very good at setting boundaries, saying, I'll deal with this when I come back or somebody else that's in the office can pick it up. Neither of those is wrong, she goes on to say. They're both valid approaches, but because there wasn't consistency, 
across all the employees, meaning because of their personality, they handled it differently and there wasn't consistent uh, ways in which they applied their time off. It created confusion and frustration and it affected the dynamics between our employees. Think about it. You can see the employee who doesn't have boundaries and is all worried about dropping the ball or somebody blaming them for something. And here they are on their day off firing five or six emails. And the person who does have the boundary who says, hey, it's my day off. They're counting on that person to reply and they don't. Now there's tension. She goes on to say, um, we found that many of our teamers had to play catch up every week. So the workload was hard to squeeze into the four days. She said it became hard for people to keep up with what had happened when they were out, and we started to notice little things slipping through the cracks that didn't hold up to our standards. At the end of the 10 weeks, Brooks took a survey and found that the employee satisfaction went down because the arrangement was creating more stress than it was intended to alleviate. So again, can I just tell you, I'd love to get her on the show. I think this is this is this is really brave leadership. You know, she goes, I'm I, I may think it's a bunch of hogwash, but I'm gonna test it. Or maybe she thought, maybe there's something in this. I don't know if it will work or not, but why don't we test it? You know? And here's the other thing she didn't do. She wasn't one of these little scared weak leaders. It was like, I know my people want this, so I'm just going to do it and deal with it. No, she said, we're going to do a 10-week test. That's brave. Do a 10-week test. We're not committing to this. We're going to test it. And she did. So impressive, Miss Brooks. Um, and so here it is, this thing that was designed to alleviate stress created more stress. So there's your sign. This is what she said. She said, people were not able to fully relax on their day off, even if they had a hard boundary and they were good at it. There was still tension and stress and anxiety about what they were missing out or how much of a pile they were going to come back to. The four-day work week might be successful. It might be. There's a lot of work to be done and a lot more testing to do and a lot more dealing with the real source. I'm going to get to that momentarily. But organizations are going to need to get to the bottom of what's causing all the stress in the first place. So take this situation. They thought, well, we'll, we'll do a four-day work week, less time in the office, and see if that reduces stress, and it doesn't. So again, you're trying to troubleshoot the source. And a good doctor dives deep into the source of the pain, and then we deal with that. And trying these novelty ideas, and again, I applaud her for doing it, but it didn't solve the problem. And what we've got going on here is, I think, just this guard. We want to put up as leaders, we want to put up a fence. We want to protect our people from burnout, but you got to know what causes the burnout. I got an article at KenColeman.com that details out the five causes of burnout. I'm going to give them to you really quick because this is good for you. And if you're a leader, you need to be checking the symptoms of your people to see if what are the sources? There's five sources of burnout. One, people don't find passion and purpose in their work. They don't sense a great deal of meaning and purpose in the job you've got them in. That could be a, a great source of burnout. Number two, there's some toxicity within your organization or individually if you're looking at this. You've got a toxic coworker, or a toxic leader or the overall culture just sucks and that's making you feel burnout. Number three, you are overwhelmed. You're overwhelmed. You feel like you're drinking from a fire hydrant that's been cranked open and just a stream of water coming out. You can't even drink. You got more water than you could possibly know how to deal with. You can't even sip it. You're overwhelmed. The fourth cause of burnout is a, a lack of recognition and 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 you feel unnoticed and overlooked. That can eat at your soul quick. Burn up your spirit just like that because you feel like you don't matter enough. The fifth cause of burnout, you're bored. You don't have a challenge. There's no challenge for you. Leaders, get to these issues. Don't just try a four-day work week or some new technique. Go, wait a second. What is going to make my people healthy? Overcoming those symptoms of burnout.
If the thought of attending a networking event makes you break out in hives, you're not alone. And I'll let you in on a secret. Networking in the traditional sense doesn't work, but genuine connection is all about relationships. That's why we created networking the right way. This free guide is the low pressure, high impact way to overcome the awkwardness, build real relationships, and turn your connections into opportunities. To get the guide, go to kencolman.com slash network. All right, folks, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. Thrilled to have you with us. Time for our coaching session. Uh, let's get right to it. Jacob in Franklin, Tennessee, right here in our backyard, has joined us. Jacob, how can I help? Hey, Ken, thanks for taking my call. You bet. So I've, I've been uh, given a an offer for a job, and but the, the salary came in uh, quite a bit lower than what I was hoping for and what I was expecting. And so I was just wondering if you had any uh, salary negotiation tips. Well, you know, uh, sure, I could give you some thoughts, but, you know, negotiation tips and strategies are, they're, they're kind of personal and, and kind of subjective because what it boils down to is you have to first decide, and this is my primary focus on this call, is, is to help you decide whether or not you're willing to walk or not because that's where it all starts. Any tips and strategies kind of need to flow from that. And so you've already dealing with a little bit of frustration uh, or maybe a little bit of confusion because you had in your mind, I, I, I want this or I need this. And now it's less. And so now you got to go, okay, the gap between what they offered and, and what I thought I might get or what I desire, or maybe we even have to own it, what I need to make, it's, it's pretty sizable. And so that strengthens my negotiation ability if I've decided, well... It's not that big of a deal. I can figure that out. I can make it up. So does that make sense, what I'm saying? I, I think so. Uh, just kind of the difference between uh, basically what I'd be willing to take the job for versus what I want. Yeah, like, like you know, because it strengthens your negotiation position is my point. Tips and strategies don't matter until you know, am I, like, am I playing poker here or am I truly, like, I'm not bluffing. I, I'm, I, I won't take the job unless they bring it to this point. So what did they offer? Uh, yeah, it's been offered at, at 110. And what did you want or expect? Or what do you I need? Was expecting, I was expecting the high, like high 120s. And why um, were you so expecting we're, that? Uh, just because of the research I've done kind of, uh, kind of across the board of, of what uh, this kind of position gets. Um, okay, great. So you got market analysis that points yes, pretty clearly to – um, in my area, our zip code here in Williamson County, and your experience and your skill set, uh, you believe that you can make the case of them that you should have gotten 120 or that other people would pay you 120 for the same position. High 120s. Right. Right. Yes, sir. All right. So they offered you 110. So if they offer you, if they come back to you and offer you 115 and say, that's our cap, what's your, what's your answer? Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to go back again to, and I guess ask for more again. No, no, no. You didn't um, hear what I said. See, that's what I'm trying okay. to tell you. Are you willing to walk away from this offer? Let's start there. I tried to take you there and you're like, well, I think I understand what you're saying. No, I've been pretty clear. Are you willing to walk if they don't give you high 120s? Y yes, sir. I am. You will walk away. Even if they offer you 118. Uh, I would. Uh, because, Great. Because I think, because the, uh, the job market, I mean, and especially like the position that I've, I've applied for and, and been offered. Um, I mean, it, you know, that was basically the top of the range that, that they had posted, but the position has sat vacant for uh, a while. And, and so I'm, I'm hoping that because that vacancy has been sitting there for, I mean, I guess eight, nine months, um, in a pretty hot job right. market. For, okay. For Great. This so here's thing. the deal. My time is limited with you that I had to establish that right there. What was okay. your walkaway point? And so if you're going, Ken, I'm not going to take it for 121. I'm not going to take it for 122. It's like an auction. Hey, give me a 123, 124, 124. You know, if you're going, no, Ken, it's got to be 125 or higher, then that's the position we start from. And you go back to me and you go, hey, guys, thank you for the offer. I appreciate it. I'd really like to work with you guys. Um, but 
based on the market research that I've done, um, and and I believe that I am matching up with what the market bears. Uh, the offer the offer needs to be in the high 120s, and um, I can't take the job for anything less than that. And that's all you do. There's no back and forth and smooth talk, and it's just I'm really grateful for the offer. I want to work with you guys, but uh, based on what's out there and what I can get doing this in other places and what the market bears, the offer's low, uh, and it you know it, it needs to be you know between 125 and 129. Tell them or tell them the exact number. I'd be happy okay. to join you, but it's got to be it's got to be 128, or it's got to be north of 125. You got to tell them what you want. That there's no negotiating. It's just you communicating, and then you got to be willing to walk. And if you make it clear like that, they're gonna hear you. They're gonna understand. Oh, okay. And then you get to decide. Duh, here we go. So you just landed the new job. Congratulations. You've made it past the interviews and now it's time to onboard with excellence. That's why I created How to Stand Out at Your New Job. This free checklist will help you succeed from day one and may even help you get promoted. These practical steps set you up to add value, help your team win, exceed your leader's expectations, and ultimately set you up for a successful transition. To get started, just go to kencoleman.com slash new. Let's go to Tucson, Arizona here on the Ken Coleman Show, and Rachel is on the line. Rachel, how can I help? Hi there. So excited to, to be on the show. Um, first of all, I'm the same age as you. Oh. I'm uh, a social worker with over 20 years in the field, mostly behavioral health, but now focusing more on integration of medical in with there as well. Okay. Um, so I, I have a bachelor's degree with a license, which is great, but no master's degree, which is usually required for moving up in clinical. But I've also found that I want to focus on a different area. Um, healthcare data analytics is something I want to dive into. And there's also a big demand. Um, I would probably need to start with project management, but then I need skills in regards to data analytics. So um, my question is, how would you recommend I broach this with my employer? Um, I've got a long time in with them and I do feel valued for them to maybe invest some of the training costs because I'm yeah. also in baby step three. Yeah, I love this. Uh, what I would do is come to them with, with a couple of options and in coming to them with options on the data. If I heard you right, you need the data analytics training, correct? Yes, and there yeah. is a gap at my company in this area. Great. So I, I do want you to contact Bethel Tech. If you've been listening or watching my show, you know I endorse them. They're amazing. they got a nine-month online program. And uh, it's a shade over $15,000 uh, at sticker price, but it's a discount if you're a Ken Coleman listener. So okay. call them up, talk to them, kick the tires, and say, what's my Ken Coleman <laughs> discount? I think it's like it's over $1,000, some, somewhere in that range. And so you get a real okay. number, right? Then you go find another one. And what I want you to do is sit down with your leader and go, hey, I've done some research on two really good or three good uh, training programs that will get me the data analytics skills that I want and that I need to step into the role here that I really want to step into. And here's mm -hmm. where I'm at. Find, and here's what they cost. So show them. Okay? okay. So you show them all the numbers and then you go, but here's the challenge. Here's where I'm at in my personal finances. I believe that I'm going to be out of debt if all goes to schedule within such and such a time. I believe it's going to make me a better worker. I mean, just lay the whole vision in front of them and go, mm -hmm. I'm not expecting, nor am I demanding with this request. But I thought, mm -hmm. I've got nothing to lose. The worst thing that can happen is you guys say, hey, we can't do this. So here's mm -hmm. what I'm asking you to do. Would you consider uh, paying for my training? Mm -hmm. With the understanding that I get this training, that you're also going to pour into me and develop me in other areas, and I could step into what I believe is a clear gap at our company. I mean, that's how I'd lay this out. That's very thoughtful. Uh, you're showing some hunger and some humility. You, you, you've you done your homework, and they can see, oh, 
okay, well, this program would cost this, this program would cost this. And, and they can just truly assess this request with full knowledge of what you're proposing and what you're wanting to happen. That's how I would do it. Awesome. Yeah, because I really want to stay with this company until I require if, uh, retire if I by can. By the way, so. by the way, add that. Start off with okay. that. Okay. Hey, guys. Um, first of all, I want to tell you how much I, I love the company, how much I appreciate you all. I feel valued. And and I don't see myself ever leaving unless you all kick me out the door. Okay. And I don't plan to do anything to make you kick me out the door. And so I want to talk to you about my future. I've been thinking about something and I have a pretty easy proposal that I want your take on and then do the rest yeah. of the stuff that I said. That's awesome. what I would do. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I feel really good about that. I'm so excited. Yeah. Um, yeah just the advice of having the, the different costs and stuff. Now, because, time. because I've got you on the phone, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be a good coach if I didn't say, all right, what are we going to do if they say no? How much, um, how much, I'm, how much I'm, debt do you have? Oh, uh, well, I'm in baby step three, um, oh, but good. I've really got to hammer good. away at retirement now. Cause, well, that's you know. fine. Okay. So I'm sorry. Um, I miss, I misunderstood. So you're in baby step three. When will you, uh, find, uh, uh, fully fund your emergency fund? Um, probably in just a couple months. So just a couple months, you're now going to work on, now you're just putting 15%, um, mm -hmm. into retirement and you're going to be in a position to do the 15% easily. Correct. Right. Well, so here's my point. If they say, oh, gosh, we love you, Rachel, but we can't do it or we won't do it or whatever, I want you to be prepared for that answer. Okay. I'm hopeful that they're going to do it, but if they don't, you have to decide, how is that going to affect me? Mm -hmm. You got to be realistic well, about it. It's not going to feel good. I don't good. think it would stop me from my goal, but I'll be super bummed out and it'll just take me longer. That's my point. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to stop you. It will bum you, but it won't stop you. And so, meaning you may have to, so you're going to have to look somewhere else, another company, or, or you're going to have to say, all right, I'm going to have to pay for it myself. What must mm -hmm. be true for me to do that? And so gotcha. I know you want to be saving 15% towards retirement and you can do that. And I would suggest that you can also make more money, side money, do whatever, and come up with the money to, like, for instance, Bethel Tech is going to be 15000 and change. Let's take the Ken Coleman discount off there. How long would it take you to save up the money to take Bethel Tech's data analytics program? Mm. Not that long. Not if you're serious you about it. No. Think about how intense you've been to pay off debt, fully fund your emergency fund, and, and be in a position where you are now. You could do it. That's true. I've really, really been disciplined about it. Listen. Yeah, I can do it. 15000 for you? It's not even close to insurmountable. Mm -hmm. I mean, hey, look. What could you sell? Could you, could you, could you make 1000 1500 2000 bucks selling stuff? So now we go, oh, there's 13 more. What projects can I do on the side? Is there a part-time job I can do at night? What can I do on some weekends? You know, what expenses mm -hmm. can I cut? Can I, can I find, and I'm making this up, can I find $500 a month? So now that's $6,000 in a year that I can save up just from my budget. So I'm just trying to encourage you that if they say no for whatever reason, it doesn't mean you have to leave the company. But if you've got to get that qualification and they're not willing to pay for it, then you're going to have to pay for it. And I just mm -hmm. want you to keep on keeping on. You hear me? Yep. All right, Rachel. Very cool. Proud of you. Thank you so much. You bet. You bet. Uh, that's the key, folks. I love going for it. I love putting it out there. Uh, but you, you have to prepare for – there's a good chance they say no. They may be nice about it. They may have some very legitimate reasons. You heard her admit, I could be bummed. So we have to prepare for that. We go, okay, shoot for the moon. But if we miss it, where do we land? Right? And that's the beauty of aiming high. And if you aim high and you miss, well, you still took a shot and you're better off than where you were. So let's play this out for her. She loves her company, wants to retire with them. She's hit her personal lid and professional lid as to where she is. She wants to get this training. She doesn't want to pay for it because she wants to catch up, put a little extra on retirement. Okay? So I love taking a shot here. 
That's very frugal for her to go, oh, if they can pick it up, this is found money. It's great. But, okay, you take a shot at this and your emotions are all excited because you know there's a chance. It's like the scene in Dumb and Dumber, you know, with Lloyd Christmas, you know, the idiot ask whatever Mary Swanson if she would marry him. And she says no. And he's like, well, like, what would the chances be? And she says one in a million, and she's trying to, like, let him down easily. She cringes when she says it. And his response is, so you're telling me there's a chance. This is the human spirit. So so Rachel right now feels like there's a good chance they're going to say yes to this. I don't know if it's a good chance or not, but there is a chance. But it doesn't matter how good the chance is. When we get excited about something, we tend to make it a little bit bigger. But we've got to be willing to do that, but also go, there is a equally an equal chance that it doesn't happen. Oh, there it is. Thank you, Nathan. Immediately puts it up on the screen. So you're telling me there's a chance. And that's Rachel right now. And she's like, okay, there's a chance. But we also need to understand there's a chance they say no. And what does that mean to us? We can't lose our good attitude. We can't lose sight of the vision that we want to retire in this place. We can't lose sight of the fact that we can pay for it ourselves. And it's not going to stop us. So yeah, go for it. Go for it. But be prepared that when we go for it, we might not get there the first time, the second time, the third time, or the fourth time, but we can still get there. Good stuff, Rachel. You're going to get there. Ain't no stopping you. This is The Ken Coleman Show. Press on. Thanks for listening to The Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.